Welcome back to my interview with Zane, the owner of Bobacoma, a brand new bubble tea shop in London. That's a really good point that you brought up. Before you open your grand opening, your, you know, your big wabang, right? Before that, doing a soft opening. Mm -hmm. Friends, family, the people in the neighborhood that you've built rapport with, having them come in. That way your staff can come in. They're already, you know, trained up or partially trained up. It's a good opportunity for them to interact with customers, yes. get a feel for everything. What's it like when people are actually coming in and there's actually a queue? What is it like when you run out of boba? Like, yeah. how do you handle that? So learning everything slowly before there's a line going down the street, mm -hmm. right? That's really great that you brought that up. And I think that that's something that I always share with new business owners um, when I'm doing online mentoring or video mentoring is just, making sure that they know, do a soft opening before you do yeah. your grand opening. It's so important. And a lot of people don't think that, but it, it is actually really important. A soft opening really allows you to connect with your audience. It really allows you to connect with your consumers, your customers, it allows you to build that relationship with them, like you said. But then of course, again, bubble tea is very new to the UK. It still is new, in my opinion, based on, based on the research that I've done. Uh, a percentage of the community don't necessarily know what it is. Mm -hmm. So you could actually convince someone to become a customer just by giving them a little treat of being able to try a snippet of what you have to offer. Having that soft opening with the staff inside, building on what they know, because I feel like, again, the psychology behind business, you want to have those good interactions and empower those working with you, taking their opinion on. So the way the shop is set up now, it might not be that way come Friday and the grand opening. It might be that the fructose machine has moved over to the other side of the store and that shaker machine is now here just evolving every day. And I feel like that soft opening just gives you that, that opportunity just to make those final perfect touches before you open the door to the public and that's it. You're open, you're open 365 days a year <laughs> and you're ready to give everyone what they deserve, yeah. which is the best bubble tea drink possible. Awesome, that's really great. So one of the things that people often ask me on my YouTube channel is how much does it cost to start a bubble tea shop? And my answer unfortunately is always the same. It's, it completely varies. Country, state, region, city. Are you, do you have a cart, a kiosk, a shop? Are you in a shopping center? Do you have a truck? I mean, it is all over the place. Someone could start with a little, you know, push trolley in some random country for a few hundred thousand. But I know in central London, a lot of these bubble tea shops, some of them, you know, just the franchise fee alone is 75 to 100,000. Yeah. Then you've got to spend the additional money outfitting the place. So you're talking about potentially hundreds of thousands of pounds or dollars to open a bubble tea shop. So mm -hmm. for you, uh, did you go over budget, under budget? And also what were some incurred costs that happened that you were not expecting at all from when you maybe outfitted or things that came across for you? I'm happy to confirm that actually we were under budget. Yay. And again, the reason why we were under budget is because of the savvy person I am asking for discounts left, right and center. But then of course, as with every other business, you do incur some hidden fees. Based on my experience, I wouldn't necessarily say there was any like super large investments that we had to make. There's loads of lovely bubble tea shops out there in the world and loads of bubble tea shops that are worthy of franchising. We, as a team, we've always been the type of people to kind of want to do things ourselves. And I feel like being able to build a brand as well is one thing. It did take a lot of work where we kind of had the freedom of uh, just being involved in this very heavily. It kind of helped us to feel a lot more confident in the process. Sometimes you don't need to go for the franchises. Sometimes you can build your own franchise and that's what we decided to do. We decided to build a brand and hopefully one day people like it, start franchising. Nice. Yeah. And the other beneficial thing is when you've got your own brand, you know, whether it's a small business, mom and pop, or just, you know, just a small company that you've created, you can create your own drinks as well. Like you were sharing with me, you know, off camera, some mm -hmm. of the amazing drinks that you've got on your menu. And I was like, wow, I got really excited. I don't know about you, but no, some of those definitely. drinks, I was like, I want to try that hands down, bring it my way right now. Mm -hmm. But if you had a franchise, you know, unfortunately you can't really do that. You can only sell the drinks that the people at the top are telling you that you can sell. Fairly enough, they don't want you creating drinks that don't taste good and then it ruins their brand. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there is a benefit to purchasing into a franchise, but other times uh, going the small business route, in my opinion, is the better way to go because you can be more creative, have your whole family get involved. Someone's good at this, someone's good at that. 
And then even when your staff come on, someone, you know, maybe wants to do social media, someone is really good at creating new yeah. flavors. Like you just don't know what kind of people are gonna be attracted to you in your business mm -hmm. and wanna work for you um, and be a part of this new creation yeah. that will lead to just such amazing things. I totally agree with you. And, and based on what you said as well, you just have full reign, you have full control. You can be as creative as possible should you decide to of course go down that route of creating and running your very own brand that's what kind of sets you apart you know someone might feel that they actually want to come to you instead because you have something different to offer and what we did find is that a lot of places kind of offer the same variations and in the recent years there's not been anything brand new to the list so that's what we called upon our childhood and that's what we called upon cultural backgrounds and we decided to actually fuse both together because why not give someone the chance to taste your childhood why not give someone the chance to experience something new something again we've tried and tested we've allowed not only family members and friends to try but also people walking down the street customers potential customers asking for their opinions and I think one thing that's very important as well is during the whole process whether that's a design that you're going to place on the wall whether that's the the, the, the look of your cups or the aesthetics of your environment ask for people's opinions and sometimes of course you know, some opinions might be brutal but <laughs> they're needed they need mm -hmm. it take it on the chin listen to what people have to say reflect 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 and I think that's one thing that I've really found very useful about this and probably something that I'll continue to remember throughout my life is the idea that you can change at any time you can do whatever you want and as you said previously you have free reign to do whatever you want when it's your own brand and I know you touched a little bit on on the design and I really like what you've done thank you um, I know from an aesthetic point of view that gray is a very trendy color in the world in general mm -hmm. and the gray and black thing right now within the um, branding is also very popular and on point for where bubble tea is headed mm -hmm. so I like your design I like your logo I thank like you. that but also you've got some other really cool things it looks like you've had an artist come in and yeah. do this side of the wall yeah. that looks awesome and also over here even though it's not lit up it it looks like it's lit up yeah. like it almost looks like it's backlit that's yeah. really cool thank you and also from the outside the shop looks really presentable as well mm -hmm. um, you kind of see it as you're walking by and you kind of look oh what's going on you yeah. know so yeah so that's good you put a lot of thought into it no definitely. definitely and again like I said previously we wanted to bring something new to the area we wanted to bring something to the area that will, that people especially young people could see as being inspirational the way the public received very positive comments about the aesthetics of the building now we're just waiting to receive some very positive comments about and feedback about the drinks that we're going to be uh, soon to serve well already your social media looks amazing some of the pictures Thank that you've you. put up so far they look like I'm I like I'm like oh, I want to try that drink you yeah. know to invest into a, a, a media package you know put yourself out there just try your best to create a very strong brand spend that extra get someone professional to come in don't ask them to heavily edit the pictures because you don't want to mislead people into buying a product that doesn't actually look like what you're going to serve. Mm. But try to capture the best and the most accurate representation of your, your drinks and what it is that you wish to serve. So in your opinion and from your experience so far, what might be some of the main differences about opening a bubble tea shop in London versus anywhere else in the UK, for example? The rates in London, they're very premium. They're sky high. You do have to fork out in order to open up a business in London and I feel like as well, based on the research that I've completed, there's a lot of scrutiny about businesses that are located in the London area. Not only scrutiny from organisations and from the local authority, but you're also under scrutiny from a lot of influence from the, the consumer's opinion. Things can get escalated really quick if someone has maybe had an unfortunate experience at your shop. The local authority will, you know, come to your shop and they will have a meeting with you and they will want to investigate what's actually happened and why there's concerns about the safety of the items that you're providing and you're resourcing. Read the guidelines from the local authority of the area that you wish to open your shop in. Look at it carefully. Try to find a retail unit. Try to find a shop. Try to find a store that you know is capped at maybe £13,000 rent per annum in London because at that point especially if you're a, a small business you don't necessarily have to pay the business rate so again that's a, another investment that you don't have to make on a monthly basis. Try your best to get the best deal possible by reading those guidelines and don't be afraid 
to contact your local authorities business department directly build a rapport with a specific individual and just liaise with them build that relationship with them ask them to come to your shop speak to them visit them email them have every form of communication with that one individual and i'm sure that they will support you as they did me don't be shy to network 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 and <laughs> hopefully people will look after you yeah well that's really great also some of the other things that might be a little higher in price <laughs> might be the actual employment rate of certain niche uh, industries like electricians plumbers uh, you know shop outfitters they probably charge slightly higher rates than you know the middle of nowhere in the West Midlands or something, you know, those things need to be taken into account as well when you're putting together your business plan, um, kind of researching specifically to your area, specifically within London, how much do those trades cost? Yeah. I was very surprised by the rates. I was honestly very surprised by the rates because before entering a commercial property, just straight residential at home, you know, either calling a plumber to come in, but then the rates are totally different. You're paying double, triple the price of what you would normally pay someone to come to your commercial property than to come to your home. You have to fork out for this because you need that certification there. You need to have that in accordance with the regulations. One thing that we did learn is to actually get every single piece of machinery pat tested, which is very important because you want to know <laughs> if there's any faulty machine because the last thing I want is on grand opening day there to be one machine that causes a fault mm -hmm. and then the electrics cut off and then no one is getting any bubble tea. If we have things prepped, we can continue to serve them, but if we don't have the EPO system working, then how are we gonna take payments? It's just not gonna work or be feasible. So I suppose taking a precaution and trying your very best to just think forward. And again, don't be shy to call up more than one company for quotes. Mm. Don't be shy. And don't just feel like you need to go with someone who gives you a very good vibe on a phone or someone that has brilliant phone service. Don't. Invest into someone who is going to invest into you. And someone, again, that you could build a relationship with. And yeah, now I'd like to believe I've got a guy who can sort out shop signs. I've got an artist available. I've got an electrician that I can call upon anytime everyone's qualified and yeah i pretty much have a direct contact number for pretty much everything that's and great. anyone and just so everyone knows out there in the world we have in the uk something called a it's a pat test right yeah. and it's basically where the electrician comes in every single item that has an electrical socket yes he tests it because the voltage in the uk is 240 volts mm -hmm. i believe right so it's really high so if you plug something in here and it short circuits or there's a problem with the electrics inside it will blow everything and it could be days until you can get an electrician to come yeah. sort all of the electrics out again. Of course, having a fuse box helps, but still, um, you know, it could just do a knock on effect and who knows how far it can go. We just don't want to take that chance. Yeah. So in this country, the electrician will come, he'll test every single electrical appliance. He'll put a little sticker on there that says it's been pat tested. Yeah. And then that way, you know, you are good to go. Like for example, um, this one right here. It says it's passed the electrical safety test. Ta-da! So that little sticker will be on every single electrical appliance. Mm -hmm. And then that way you know and you have peace of mind that everything is ready to go. And then also if like the London City Authority comes in and they say, hey, um, we want to see if you're legit. Where's your checklist for all your PAT tests? Where's your checklist for that? I'm sure you know, you've got folders for everything, yeah. health and safety, um, electric, you can prove uh, with your chemical usage of cleaning. Yeah. They want to know, you know, how long do you need to spray something on a counter and leave it sit for before you wipe it off? Yeah. And I'm sure now um, with everything that's happened in the world, they want to take an, an extra step further. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They really want to know that you're cleaning, that you're hygienic and that you've done everything health and safety based. Mm -hmm. So you can get that five star rating. No, and that's what it's all about, that five star rating. Yeah. Very essential in my opinion. I feel like you need to have documentation printed, but then you also need to have documentation online. Should anything happen, should you lose your evidence, what we've done as well, what I would recommend other bubble tea shop owners to do as well is create a Google Drive or an online drive and have it set out so that you know what's in what folder, putting invoices on there, you're adding receipts to your drive, you're also adding your documentation and even small stuff like um, with the uh, fridge temperatures and freezer temperatures when you have to conduct those, you can easily do that by hand but then also take some time to then transfer that online. So should anything ever happen to your documents, you've got that there, so there's no need to worry. All right, Zane, so I wanna just do a really fun, 
quick back and forth thing. Let's go. Expectations versus realities. Uh -huh. All right. So first, we'll start with the key point of the lease. I feel like before you set out and you open a bubble tea shop, please have a read through your Experian credit report. Read through your credit report. Check to see if you have the requirements of opening up a business because it might be that you have a low score or it might be that you don't have the, the accurate information you might not have the right finances that the landlord might request to see in order to actually process your lease don't be hurt if your lease is refused it's not necessarily always because they don't agree with your business it might just mean that someone has placed a very uh, high offer where they need the premises and they might have the financial backing there to pay you know, 5,000, 10,000 pound more per annum. And of course, for that reason, you know, business is business and the landlord's probably gonna give the person who's paying the most money the shop. So yeah, that's just how it is. And funnily enough, we actually signed papers. We showed some interest in a commercial shop that's probably about 15 minutes away from here. And on the day of us submitting the documents, we found out that actually the property was now under offer and it was taken and funny enough they're actually opening a bubble tea shop in that exact shop Whoa. in that exact shop can Whoa, you believe that, that it's is just crazy. crazy it's like two people had the same idea and somebody just got in there just before i didn't necessarily know that until probably two weeks ago when i drove past and i had seen that it was a bubble tea shop and i was like how crazy is that i actually applied for this shop i done all the paperwork and now someone else is opening up a barber tea shop there. But you know what? It's okay. And I feel like that motivated us to, to get things finalised, to get things moving. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just to bring something different to the community. So yeah, in terms of the lease, give things a go. Speak directly to the landlord. Find out what they want. Don't be afraid to present your business. Don't be afraid to share your business plan with them. And I suppose maybe giving printing it out in, in a printed copy and just being available to answer all their questions and queries that might help you with actually getting the lease. But then of course you've got to pay solicitor fees. But then again, shop around. Don't just go to someone that can say that it can do everything for you because some people have different time frames. Some people charge different based on the hours that they're working on your case. Just try to find someone who who, who wants to help you. Not that wants your money, but wants to help you and wants to invest and wants you to be a part of their portfolio. Just communicate with everyone and anyone. Put your time in. Yeah. Good, good. That's really great advice. And that's interesting because um, that actually happened to us as well. We found a unit that we wanted to expand into and we, we put forth everything. We, we go, oh, we're gonna get this. And of course, it's a perfect location. They need a bubble tea shop. This is amazing. Yeah. And we didn't get it. We're like, that's, that's strange. A month or two later, we drove by, we're like, it's a bubble tea shop. Like, uh, what are the odds that that place that we wanted, we knew was perfect for a bubble tea shop, and another one came along and got it just before us. Crazy. They were a, a larger chain, so I think they okay. probably, like you said, prompted them with more money for per That's annum. What happens. Expectations versus reality for health and safety. So I feel like the expectation is that you read a document and then that's it. But the reality of it is that it's beyond the document. Sometimes the document doesn't actually state everything that you have to do. And sometimes you need to get clarity about certain points because people interpret things in different ways. You know, I might read a sentence and say, okay, I've inferred this from it. You might read a sentence and say, oh, I've inferred this from it. But speaking directly to your local authority, finding out from them what guidelines they have to ensure that you're opening a shop that again, adheres to the rules and regulations and in terms of health and safety again do your research online you don't necessarily have to spend three four five hundred pound on a level three certificate you don't there's some that are available at a reduced cost so look into different avenues and don't just stop there at a level three you know try to go above and beyond try to do a le level three and maybe food allergies like up level your subject knowledge on what it means to run a business because at the end of the day you need to lead by example, don't you? As a bubble tea shop owner, you need to know what it is that needs to happen so that staff can consequently follow through with your model. It helps people become your regulars because they know that you've gone above and beyond to ensure a safe experience for them, again, as well as a delicious one. Read the documents, do your training, 
but always try to do more than what is needed. Some people say less is more, but then sometimes I believe that more is better and more, 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 more. <laughs> Sorry there, more, just do more. <laughs> also as well, like don't be afraid to talk to your family members or friends about their experiences in working in maybe a restaurant because a lot of that is transferable to a bubble tea shop. You know, they might have worked in the kitchen, they might have been a waiter or a waitress and you can pick their brains. You can say, oh, what did they use? What did they use? What did they mm. use? And just create documents accordingly and it won't do anyone any harm. Right. Like for example, blue towel, you know? Yeah. When I first started, I wasn't aware that in the UK there's something called blue towel. There is. And it's really amazing and it cleans really well and it's not expensive and it you know makes things shiny and yeah. oh blue towel but it took someone one of my staff members who prior worked at a restaurant to go you know oh why are you using this you should use blue towel and i was like oh i've never even heard of it mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's a really good example um and the other thing that i was going to mention uh for for health and safety in in the uk is that it's not just like you said a booklet that you read through and you check off the thing no it's actually knowing like what documents you need to have what cleaning products you need to have um, where does everything have to be located a uh, hot sink cold sink like just there's so many different things that you need to know for health and safety but there's also online training that you have to do yeah. one two three four and beyond and one thing that i did was my staff once they were with me for a minimum of a month they had to do level one training for sure Brilliant. and i paid for it for them that was part of their initiation to get to the next level of being a staff member with mm -hmm. us and then from there when they did level two then they got a slight pay raise it was kind of a way to incentivize them to want to continue on with their learning of health and safety to get certified and then also they could take those certificates and put them in our booklet so they were proud to be like, this is my certificate, it's part of everyone else's, mm -hmm. they're part of the team. So um, there's ways to kind of make it work for, for different businesses and different staff members and for management as well, yeah. definitely. And yeah, as you said, residential and commercial, different game. You have to buy different cleaning equipment. I didn't know this until I completed the relevant online training and what I found is that actually there's sprays that are available where you leave it on for 30 seconds or up to a minute and every single piece of bacteria on that surface or maybe 99.9% because that's what they usually claim yeah. <laughs> have been totally removed and mm. I suppose as well this just allows you to have a safer environment and of course you can show and you can prove that you're going to the lengths of you're actually investing into high quality cleaning equipment to make sure that you know you're running a safe service really and it's also better in a sense because that way when they come in every six months or a year or I don't know how they, often they come in in London but for me I think they came in like once a year that way they know from their previous notes or whoever was there before oh yeah this place is easy everything was good so they just kind of go yeah everything looks the same ask a few questions check a few temperatures all right you get, to, you get to keep your five stars, no problem. As opposed to making them jump through hoops every single time, going, oh, this shop again, all right, I gotta check this, I gotta check that, blah, 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 blah. It makes it easier for them, mm -hmm. and then that way it's it's less stress for you because when they walk through that door, oh, your heart goes, oh my gosh. Yeah. It's the uh, food hygiene inspection people, oh my goodness, you get a little nervous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know everything's fine, but it still is a little nerve wracking. So no, just get rid of that stress and just make it easy for you, make it easy for your staff, and make it easy for their lives as well. Expectations versus reality for opening a shop in London. You don't need to ever feel alone. In my opinion, you know, you have people that if you get a shop and you, you, you've secured the keys, your, your neighbours, local shop owners, they'll be more than happy to support you. You just have to put yourself out there, really. A lot of people think, oh, it's London, it's the most competitive city in the entire United Kingdom. I'm just gonna forget it. It's just a pipe dream of mine or whatever. But no, actually, if you go out there and you do it and you do your best, and everyone else is going out there and doing their best, all that's doing is creating an amazing environment for everyone to enjoy. Yeah. bubble tea, making it better. Imagine if all of the people that I've been able to mentor decided, yeah, you know what, I don't want to open a bubble tea shop in the end. That would be doing a disservice to humanity yeah, because they have all created such amazing businesses, such amazing recipes, amazing drinks, and they're sharing bubble tea with the world in a unique way, like yourself with the drinks you were mentioning to me, that couldn't have been enjoyed otherwise. So expectation versus reality of opening a shop in London, I suppose, the first thing before being a business owner, being a consumer, you know, going around the place, you notice that actually if someone's done something and it's working for them, sooner or later, 
two, three months down the line, someone else is going to come on that very same road and they're going to open up a shop. But I've anticipated that within six months, someone else will also bring through a bubble tea shop to Leighton High Road. Now, am I worried? No, why? Because it's, it's a usual thing, you know, on this one road, you have 10 grilled chicken shops, you know, and they all serve grilled chicken. However, everyone kind of has their own decoration. Everyone has a different experience. Everyone has a different hygiene rating, which of course, you know, is a very big indicator as to whether or not you really want to go somewhere and eat. At the end of the day, Boba Coma was created for our local community, for the wider community, for bubble tea enthusiasts to travel into the latent area, see what it has to offer and give it a go. So I think we would be doing a disservice if we weren't going to open a bubble tea shop. You just have to create the opportunity yourself, break down the door, and then just make it happen. Zane, thanks so much for having us here today. It's just been an amazing experience, and everything you said was gold, and it was so inspirational and inspiring. It makes me wanna, makes me wanna open up another bubble tea shop right away. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> oh, oh, another tea coming very soon. <laughs> right, awesome. Well, thanks again, really You're appreciate it. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you very much. And guys, listen, Kristen is an absolute legend. She's very helpful. She's honestly supported us a lot, so this is the person that you need to Thank go you. to for your bubble tea advice. Go to her and you'll be a very happy person. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that.